welcome everyone uh, it's really a pleasure we are also this is our first uh, of many to come in conversation with nexus series as kainath mentioned and um, yeah first thing first hope you all continue to be safe and well in such unprecedented times uh, completely you know uh, the entire entire world has been has been taken by you know it's kind of bolt from the blue from for everyone and hope everyone is uh, staying safe and well uh, we have attendees from uh, across us and india us uh, it's it's late so um, thank you for those who could make it um, and uh, we will next time onwards we'll try to find out a time where things might be more comfortable for everyone uh, so for for all of you who have joined thank you very much um a quick recap on nexus venture partners uh, for those who may not be knowing us we are integrated one fund and one team across india and us and we focus on early stage and early growth stage companies and uh, we prefer to lead seed and series a rounds and then support the companies through the life cycle and we invest both in saas and consumer tech companies uh today we have abhina vastana co-founder ceo of postman um whom i would i would i would think you know whether bo probably both abhina as well as postman and if not abhina definitely postman you would be aware of um welcome abhina thank you for joining and uh, really appreciate you taking the time here uh, i intend to keep the session engaging and interactive uh what we would do is in out of remaining let's say 80 minutes or so first 30 minutes i intend to i plan to ask abina a few questions to get the conversation going post which i will i will open up open it up for audience questions and as kanat said please write your questions over the qa window and uh, she will be collecting questions and we will all both me and abina uh, when i think abina probably will do most of the speaking so i will i will keep a track of the questions and and i will be asking abhinav um so abhinav um it has been a fascinating journey to say the least from three guys and a dog in a house in indiranagar in bangalore when we first met you 6 years back to a multi billion dollar multinational company today lot to discuss um to kick it off uh, it would be great if you can introduce postman in your own words and uh, yeah sure. yeah okay. thanks for thanks for having me just now uh, you know great to be here uh, and uh, yeah special credits to you know mentioning cooper uh, who you know was our chief happiness officer that's how, that's when you know like you know uh, uh, how early we partnered uh, so uh, i think uh, you know we've been trying to always keep up with the growth rate of like cooper <laughs> at least in our early years so uh yeah it's it's been a great journey and you know happy to share uh, like you know our experience as much as you know i would kind of recall uh, going back to the early days uh so uh i mean i where would you like me to begin you know is it more maybe, on the product side yeah yeah like i i was thinking of like you know maybe you can give overview of postman just sure, just sure. Uh, uh, postman in your own words and then you know i will try to tee it up with some questions and then it's very free flowing and the whole idea yeah. is that in you know, audience really wants to hear from you there might be certain things i might not be asking but your views will be much appreciated sure yeah so uh, you know postman is a collaboration platform for api development today it's uh, the industry standard the platform on which more than 11 million developers and more than half a million companies you know build and consume apis uh we have uh, grown since a side project that i created in 2012 and uh, my marketing tactic at that time was you know putting it on stack overflow and uh, uh, github so it kind of you know grew from there it uh, was built to solve a pain point for me uh, for most of my life i'd say until 2016 was kind of you know when i stopped committing code to uh, postman uh, i had been a developer and most of postman was built uh, in you know at least the first version to solve all the issues that i faced with api development uh, and what i uh, had seen you know was that these problems were actually global in nature uh, and it kind of intersected with the growth of apis 
So yeah, today Postman is a complete uh, you know platform. We are more than 250 people across uh, San Francisco and Bangalore, uh, and actually more than eight countries. We are also pretty distributed. Uh, we have raised uh, you know three rounds of uh, funding so far. Uh, you know our first partner being you know Nexus uh, Ventures with our seven million Series A, uh, and you know th- we have uh, added two more partners since then, raising uh, a total of uh, uh, you know more than 200 million dollars. Thank you, thank you. That's that's uh, very helpful. So, so to to start with, uh, one question I had is uh, which which you know we you and I discuss in at, at different times, whether in board meetings or otherwise. But I think it's a uh, audience will appreciate some some wisdom here. Um, one of the core tenets of Postman's Foundation is the movement from code first approach to API first approach of software development. It will be great if you can elaborate that. What it really means and how we, how Postman is accelerating that movement. Yeah, so uh, you know, I'd go back to a little bit of my experience of building uh, software. So I learned uh, you know coding in school. Basically, you know, I I learned to program on you know languages like Java, PHP, you know, Python, uh, you know, JavaScript, kind of all of these uh, languages uh, that you would kind of write code in and the end goal was to kind of build a finished application, whether it's a desktop app or as a mobile app or soon to come as a web app. And uh, that is that was kind of like primarily the way uh, software was, you know, kind of built and consumed. You would package something, you would install it and you would run it. And a lot of activity around uh, uh, software development was centered around, uh, you know, just writing code, compiling and uh, shipping. Uh, now, what kind of started happening in the early 2000s and kind of accelerated in 2010 was the advent of APIs, uh, and uh, it it was kind of intersecting with uh, the growth of the web as a delivery model for applications. But uh, in the beginning, applications were still kind of packaged and uh, kind of very self-contained. So, uh, uh, what what code first means is this focus uh, of the development activity on primarily uh, writing code. And what in the interim we saw was that a lot of code that people were, were building was actually consuming somebody else's code through uh, API calls built over a network. So uh, uh, if you think of AWS starting in 2006, Salesforce coming as a cloud platform, internal services that people were building, these are all APIs that are available for developers to consume and add much more power to their applications. Uh, and uh, over the time, this trend has uh, uh, exploded. Uh, what we what we realized in the development community is that it's far easier to build uh, really large scale, powerful applications uh, by combining APIs. And of course, you're writing some code. But in this case, you're not really thinking of code all the time. You're thinking of the modularity of applications. You are thinking of the capabilities that you can buy or the capabilities that re- you can reuse uh, in, uh, in your application. So uh, in this world, you are primarily thinking of API first. When, whether you are architecting your application uh, just from the very beginning or you are actually building a composite application by combining multiple APIs together. And what it has led to is what we call an API first world, where instead of thinking of starting from a line of code, you are starting from thinking about an API endpoint that you will be uh, creating. And uh, today, every piece of software either is an API or is consuming an API. And it's imperative for every developer to be aware of that. And uh, you know, smartphones, uh, SaaS applications, the move to the cloud, uh, microservices, serverless technologies have accelerated that trend, uh, which, which you know, all of that put together, we call API first. Um, uh, thank you. And and as a follow up of that, uh, Postman, as you described, is a collaborative network of 11 million plus developers, 500,000 plus organizations, and uh, more than 250 million APIs are there in the Postman platform. Um, and together, if all this, this, this entire kind of uh, network and virtuous cycle, we call it the API network effect. Um, 
maybe you can you can elaborate on that also a, a bit and how it is kind of like you know bringing in different pieces together how it kind of changing is changing developers lives in many ways yeah, so you know we notice an interesting uh, trend. Uh, now, of course, you know Postman started as a very simple product, but what was uh, uh, what led to its growth uh, was kind of this interesting pattern we saw that when somebody is building an API, it establishes a network of people engaged in the production and, and consumption of APIs. So if it's a small team, it's a backend developer building an API for a frontend developer. If it's a larger team, it's teams of backend developers building APIs for frontend developers. You know, when you kind of scale it up a little bit more and you are in a bigger organization, you have business units who are uh, basically, you know, consuming and producing APIs. Uh, and what it kind of leads to is this very natural form of uh, relationships that uh, people have to form with each other just because of the virtue of the technology that they are uh, building. So uh, uh, what we noticed was that while APIs themselves enable machines to talk to each other, uh, eventually it is humans who are building these APIs and they need to collaborate, they need, they need to function kind of more effectively, whether it's in the design of APIs, whether it's in the reliability of APIs, whether it's shipping APIs. And uh, it kind of scales up pretty massively uh, in a way where we are at a point where we see the entire world being connected through a web of APIs you know, all talking to each other. And they've kind of become a, a transactional unit of business. So if I'm using, let's say the AWS S3 API, uh, and there are gonna be a few dollars associated with that API call, and uh, that API is gonna be uh, used not in isolation, but with probably hundreds of APIs that are there in my, uh, my own organization. So uh, what we kind of learned was, and uh, was that Postman is being used across all of these different uh, layers and APIs for a variety of use cases. And what people are doing is once they, you know, are in the, engage, in the activity of designing an API or consuming an API, they often collaborate by sharing uh, uh, some metadata or they share, they share feedback or they actually even integrate uh, the different applications that they're using to build API. So what Postman does is kind of brings this all together in a very smooth, very simple experience and it enables this whole network to function just way faster. Now you can do that, you know, by sending files over uh, email, which is what we saw people doing. Like a lot of debugging activity essentially used to happen at that time on Google Hangouts and, you know, maybe it's a little bit of uh, Slack today, but there was no structure to it. So what Postman does is it streamlines this workflow, uh, you know, for individual developers first to then your team and then to your company and effectively, you know, now we have a public API network, which also brings, you know, companies together. And our view is, you know, at every point in time, wherever there is a common platform for uh, uh, the stakeholders to transact, uh, you know, freely and more effectively, uh, you know, everybody's workflow just runs faster. And, uh, you know, we have seen, uh, we have seen, we have been a big part of like this uh, uh, movement and effectively helping accelerate it. So it is kind of like, you know, forms a virtuous cycle. So everything, everybody benefits and more and more people and more and more APIs are coming in into the, into the network. Uh, everybody, each and every constituent, uh, they get more value, increasingly more value. So um, yeah, absolutely. At this point, you know, every API uh, company and every developer is using Postman in some way or the other. And uh, instead of using, you know, disparate tools, disparate systems, uh, they're all standardizing on Postman. Uh, there are already some good questions coming up. Uh, one, I think that you know, I can ask right now, uh, which can be quite timely, um, as people are kind of learning and, and understanding Postman. Uh, the question is, can you give a simple real world example of how developers use two to three multiple APIs to build something to explain how Postman works for a non-tech person? Uh, I mean, a co very common example that I would probably use is like a smartphone application. Uh, so if you're building a smartphone application, let's take, uh, you know, Twitter as an example. Uh, so you load up Twitter, uh, you know, your tweets are not sitting on your phone. You know, they're sitting on a server cloud somewhere and uh, your phone makes an API call and the API call essentially fetches some data uh, from a server and renders it uh, on, on your device. And uh, let's say you go and, uh, uh, favorite something or you reply to something, all of these are individual API calls that uh, your phone is executing. Uh, 
Now for this thing to kind of come together, there is a debugging process that a developer typically goes through to see if it's working. Uh, if you are a technical architect who's designing this API call, then you would be building it and prototyping it inside Postman. Uh, we kind of, uh, so that's kind of like a typical example of how a simple application uh, you know, is making a bunch of API calls. But where Postman comes in is it helps you refine uh, for a developer, the producer lifecycle and the consumer lifecycle. So typically APIs go through this process of, uh, you know, what is the design, what is the design going to be? You know, what are my API endpoints? Uh, how am I going to uh, debug it once I've written some code? Uh, how am I going to write automated tests against it? How am I going to document it? So Postman has tools for all of these things. And as people go through the API lifecycle, more and more people uh, come into this process. So it would begin with a developer uh, specifying, okay, I'm going to build this endpoint, but then an architect might jump in and uh, uh, give you some feedback within Postman and tell you that, okay, you know, this is something that you might want to consider. Uh, once that uh, code and that uh, call is well spec'd out, it might go to a quality engineer and a security engineer who would like to test whether this API call actually works as intended or not. Uh, when it goes for consumption, uh, Postman has powerful documentation capabilities to let uh, technical writers come in and uh, kind of en en enhance the documentation of the API. Uh, when an API goes to production, we have tools to help you monitor the API to see while your API is running, uh, is, is this functional or not? So there is uh, there are of course a lot more steps and I'm kind of simplifying quite a bit but Postman has tools for each step of this process for all of these personas and actors who are engaged in the building of the API. Now, uh, parallel to that is the consumption of an API. Uh, you know, when, you, when a developer interacts with an API for the first time, instead of writing code, now they can just open up Postman and make an API call and actually generate code out of it rather than uh, the other way around. And that makes the consumption process very quickly. So they can essentially write code through Postman and integrate into, into their application. So this back and forth process repeats for like uh, all of these endpoints and, uh, and and effectively it's like this engineering process uh, that Postman uh, helps. With. Yeah, uh, thank you. And you know, anecdotally what we are also finding in different companies that today, as we know, there are several companies who sell API as products. And I know there are a lot of salespeople in different organizations. They are actually using Postman to showcase APIs to their clients because, you know, Postman does a lot of things. So functionality of the API can easily be shown and kind of like, you know, explain through Postman because there are a lot of other things. So the other person on the other side don't need to write any code or, you know, kind of do any work to understand the value of the product. So, so that way it's not just developers. Uh, I would say that, yeah, you know, a lot of yeah, other yeah, that's actually, value. yeah. Yeah, that brings a lot of things to my mind. And I wanted to kind of focus on the code use case, which is basically where we started from. But, you know, just uh, uh, yesterday I found out a CFO who uses Postman. You know, they use actually uh, Postman for like fraud detection of data. If they make an API call and they have some code that runs, you know, uh, runs that algorithm. I learned about a neuroscientist who uses Postman. You know, they have API calls when they're kind of trying to build a, a brain imaging model like essentially the world around is very, very API driven. And uh, the other thing that Postman has done outside of like this core development process is making APIs accessible to you know, everyone in the world. So you don't need to have uh, prior knowledge of code to work with APIs. And what we're seeing is that everybody in this business of APIs, like we call it, you know, it's like solution engineers, sales engineers, marketing, uh, developer relations, everybody is kind of involved in this process is is also using Postman and we've just made it very, very accessible. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, one thing uh, I I wanted to, to discuss here and, and get your thoughts is this entire phenomena of product-led growth. And uh, while product-led growth is now getting quite popular in technology vocabulary, Postman has been, I would say, product-led everything from the very inception for last six plus years. And like, you know, I always say that, you know, if there is any poster child, so to say, of running the company, building a company product led, that is Postman. Um, can, you, can you kind of like, you know, share some colors and lights on what it means, what product led uh, means for Postman? And, and, you know, it will probably touch upon a lot of things. 
so um, yeah. you can you know yeah, yeah no i'm i'm very excited that there's a name for it you know i think for us it was like this is the only way it can be done you know maybe <laughs> it it was uh, our ignorance that was like yeah we just don't know any better right uh, at that time i think <laughs> so so it's <laughs> i think what's happening is you know there are, there are a certain set of practices that are coming together in defining you know what product led means and maybe i would qualify that i think that movement is more applicable to b2b saas uh, because when we started we were kind of very surprised that you know the companies like google apple you know who are primarily you know product driven companies or product first companies right like the product is what kind of you know matters and uh, to kind of now correlate that with you know postman's experience when we started we always were very focused on solving for the end user that is where like the whole kind of story began you know we were not concerned too much about uh, i mean too much is is like you know in courts uh, you have to be a little bit concerned but not too much about you know what the buyer is going to think you know what uh, what the business model is going to be what how you're going to charge with like the first principle for us was basically making sure if a user encounters the product they have a delightful experience and what they have come to uh, use postman for is uh, accomplished as quickly as possible right and that was just kind of our personal experience of being developers right we don't have too much time there are too many distractions i have like you know so much code to write i just want to jump in and get started and if the tool is useful then i'm going to continue using it you know so uh we realized that the reason you know postman is growing is because we want to kind of we have that connection with uh, the user and uh, we want to maintain that and that percolates through product design uh, engineering the product you know your marketing website and eventually even your sales motion and that's where it becomes product led uh, and intersecting with that is you know today we have amazing distribution channels where the product reaches the hands of the end user very very quickly and there are no gatekeepers anymore you know you you log into a website and you know sometimes there's no even not even a sign up wallet and in some cases right you have the ability to advertise the product very quickly there are stores through which you know your product can reach very very quickly so product led essentially flips everything on its head you know what used to happen was you would advertise the product uh you know have your marketing website and then have a funnel and then somebody would sell the product and then after like a nine month cycle somebody would get their hands on the product and with product led what you're doing is making the product reach as many people as possible as quickly as possible and making sure that you kind of grow from there uh so postman designed for the end user and what we had to kind of consist- consistently figure out was who are these end users you know who are they uh, what are they like what are their needs and wants and how can we Uh, uh are there bigger problems to be solved there like it doesn't if if your product is very narrow you know i don't know like if if the only job of your tool is to crop an image for example right like if it's an image cropper that's the one thing it can do but if you find out that your image cropper tool is being used by designers and instead of you know image cropping they sometimes want to beautify an image uh, it, it leads to uh, expanding your user base uh, or your feature set a little bit and that comes from understanding the user a little bit more and then as you kind of add more and more and more things and you have that engagement uh, going on you realize at some point you have added enough uh, value for which uh, uh, there is separation between end user and buyers and uh, uh, you know if if uh, your tool was being used at a digital agency where there was a manager whose job is to get 50 people crop images all day they would probably pay for your tool you know so uh, so that's how it kind of evolves over time and uh, uh, what we discovered was that that uh, understanding of knowing the end user first and then effectively understanding the buyer in the b2b context is is what this product led kind of journey is and and uh, on that i uh, two i would i would like to have your thoughts on two two related aspects to it community and sales so there is a question also um a very relevant question uh on the community side can you elaborate how you build the community around postman especially in initial days does that does that also is is that also related to this product led motion and you know how that kind of develop and then the related question would be on sales so far we don't have any sales people in the company so how has that kind of happened and at what point of time you know you think in a product led motion to even think of you know having sales or is it like customer success so give some colors on both community and uh, sales as it's happening in postman 
Sure. Yeah. So, you know, for us, uh, what we started with, right, like, uh, uh, for me, a community is, is something that is not, you know, communities don't form around products. They form around unifying ideas, which everybody inside a community can believe in. Right. So this notion of APIs being important and critical to the work of developers in the future is the idea that we wanted to champion. And my goal was that, you know, uh, uh, the product is a reflection of that and the people building the product are tied to that idea of who will be connected to the community. So for us, you know, GitHub became a place where the community would congregate. We had similar ideas around where the product should go, uh, what APIs need. And uh, it typically, you know, initially people would just email me. I would get like pages and pages worth of, you know, feedback. And uh, a lot of people, you know, in, in the typical B2B motion, people don't do support, right? They're like, yeah, support is a cost. And we actually, you know, the founders did support until 2016. We still do support, you know, at times. And what that means is it creates a cohort of people who actually are your, you know, biggest champions. And they bring people around you around a unifying idea. So we did that, uh, you know, it is it's just kind of sheer hard work. It's talking to people, it's listening to people and, you know, taking in their suggestions sometimes, sometimes, you know, talking to them uh, about what your views are. And that helped kind of seed the idea, which and where the community has kind of grown a lot. So you can't really, uh, you know, grow it. Uh, it just is, is a long term effort that you have to invest in from day one. Um, and uh, I think on the sales side, uh, uh, there are, as I said, right, the distinction between end user and buyer, the moment you find that out, uh, you start realizing that you have to have, I'd say a certain kind of conversation, uh, where, which, which an experienced salesperson should be leading. And at that time, uh, there is a separation that the company probably goes through where it clearly identifies, this is my self uh, end user uh motion and then there is my sales so like we call it where uh you know let's say an it person or a, a, a legal uh, uh lead at a company or uh, somebody you know in the security department is coming to you they don't really want to know about the virtues of your product you know uh, in in most cases they want to basically make sure that the buying process is uh, efficient and they can deploy the product at scale so you might find a buyer like that uh, in most cases, in product-led companies, those are the ones we find we found. And uh, at at another level, there are people who become very curious about, hey, how can I actually, if this product is being used across my entire company, how can I actually use it effectively? So you need another level of salesperson who can guide that conversation. So it's a mix of people who can have that uh, thinking at that conversation for the buyer is where we, uh, you know, you would typically see salespeople come in. Um, uh, thank you. And it, so you nicely put it up, put it as self-serve and sales serve. So on the self self-serve side, uh, there was a there is a question which I think is related to self-serve side is what does um, how does monetization work for API developers? So so you're thinking on yeah. like you know I mean how do you kind of figure out what will pay what not and you know yeah, yeah. No, I have very strong views on that. So, so when I started, everybody was like, developers are not going to pay. And that was just, uh, I'd say, uh, I, I was just glad that everybody believes that because then we could charge something uh, for our product for which developers actually want to pay. So, uh, so the interesting thing is, right, if you look at like cloud uh, vendors, right, like AWS, for example, right, uh, you know, they make billion dollars and it's a de developer focused company, right? So I, didn't, I don't think it's true at all that uh, developers don't pay. Developers have a higher bar for value and that value bar needs to intersect with what the needs of a company are. So developers uh, are typically introducing the best of breed technology into a business process and they like to use those technologies and what typically good products are able to create is a ramp through which uh, uh, the needs of the developer are met uh, uh, with the product and the, uh, the monetized product meets the needs of the companies along with the developer. And that uh, our, our biggest champions in, in uh, companies, uh, you know, even if they're not paying with their own credit card, are actually, you know, uh, th th those are the developers and architects who are leading the sale. You know, they, uh, they have approvals, they check 
in the deal through multiple departments because it has added the product has added a lot of value in workflow and uh, at at some level to them you know the product looks uh, effectively you know cheap uh, compared to you know what uh, what they might see elsewhere in the market so uh, what what people have to get right is their monetization strategy and kind of designing for i'd say budget ownership a little bit and like how much of your product you want to give out uh, for free and how much of your product you want to charge for and then looking at the buying power uh, people might have and i think people can sometimes go too much like okay we only we have two versions one is free the other is enterprise and that typically hurts adoption uh, we chose a, a smoother ramp for our product and it's user based pricing which is very transparent it works very much like slack and github and we find out that you know sometimes uh, even the director at a company will buy a license on their own credit card because they are trying it on behalf of their developers right and they uh, so, and and sometimes we have seen that multiple people have bought it individually and they want to kind of come together so you see kind of all of these behaviors uh, and and monetization then can kind of works out yeah thank you makes a lot of sense uh, again on staying on that self serve motion because for for vast majority of postman's growth and also out of 6 years probably like initial 4 5 years was really self serve and we didn't even think of self serve uh, in that in that journey there are two aspects of business we have focused on um, other than of course the product and product led two aspects of business are customer success and marketing and not sales mm -hmm. Um, yeah. how have you thought of thought of those those uh, functions uh, and you know how does it how did that interplay with product because i think often i see that mistake that you know when people think of even in developer saas when people are thinking of selling first thing they think of is hiring sales people but it's yeah. a process that goes in and and you know you have to kind of couple uh, put together uh, you need to have product but then you know how do you make people happier using the product how do you make sure that the people are getting more value and then how yeah. what does marketing really mean for a product led organization yeah. yeah maybe you can share some light yeah absolutely so that's been a very kind of interesting i'd say uh, you know we have learned a lot uh, over the last you know few years and the way i would look at it right uh, i'd say the first marketing team is just an extension of the community effort that we were doing you know so the first people that we hired in marketing were actually people in developer relations So if you think about I mean we tend to actually see uh, what we call like these feedback loops you know and essentially what we've been doing over the last 6 years is making sure those feedback loops inside the product and the product coupled with people uh, are uh, you know more and more refined and they kind of map to what the user wants to do or the buyer wants to do so we think about it and the product was out there Uh, it was being referred to people widely but people also wanted to know how to use the product you know how to actually get value out of the product and we saw there were a lot of uh, there was a lot of engagement in the community so we thought of marketing as how can we bring the community together and how can we scale the uh, or, you know the organic work that the community is doing uh, through certain efforts in marketing that we could do so that involved hosting uh, you know meetups uh hosting events uh for us which was just this notion of you know bringing the community together and having a message that would resonate uh in line with the community as well as you know what the product uh lets you experience so that was kind of an offshoot of that and uh, customer success was just an offshoot of support we just saw that we started getting more and more support tickets and people actually wanted to buy off of support they would just write in saying that you know we just want to buy the product how do i pay for it right so until i think 2018 i was processing checks <laughs> coming to the office so we we were just like okay if you want to send a check just just you know email uh, send it to us is the address and i would just have the phone app and i would scan a check in and then that process became uh so i'd say frequent then we were like okay we should uh, instrument this out into a proper customer success motion that not only does the thing get done but how can we uh, scale it and do it better right so at every level we think of a great experience for the user and that extends to not just the product but you know your entire marketing your entire uh, customer success motion so we stress on that in over time what we have had to do is uh, you know just scale uh, those efforts so you know we have great people on the team uh, we have uh, 
now kinlan who uh, uh, used to be you know uh, the industry leader around apis he ran this uh, he runs this blog called the api evangelist and he's our chief evangelist now and our focus is you know uh, how can we help the community right does the product intersect with community efforts uh, we have uh, uh, on the customer success side we have great uh, solution engineers who are actually industry leaders in the api industry and they are going and helping deploy api strategy at scale and we find out that the moment uh, a problem gets solved for the user through these motions you know a sale is an outcome uh, that is well determined so that's how we have kind of built these things um, i'd say the other pillar for this always we looked at was operational efficiency like uh, everything has to have metrics everything you know if we if we were able to let's say you know it took us one month to put a webinar uh, one year ago you know can we put a webinar together in in a week you know can we now put a webinar in two days right if there is demand for that and that's exactly kind of what our marketing team done, does and you know we we get about uh, uh, you know 20 to 25000 registrations per webinar today right so that's the level of engagement that we have just through you know kind of iterating on that cycle and uh, yeah thank you and um, I, there is an interesting question which kind of comes into the intersection of sell self serve and sales serve and also sometimes what we say avinav is bottom up and top down so mm -hmm. we are influencer driven like all our users are our influencers and then when sales serve come in we are also having an engaging at the at the kind of like you know more senior senior level um yeah. and to for enterprise wide deals and all that so the question specifically was what were the ingredients that enabled postman to make the transition from b2c developer community who were your champions to a successful b2b enterprise business i don't i do, i i i mean you know we may not have i don't think i think we are both b2c uh, developer community and as well as a b2b enterprise business it's not either or but you know yeah. how that that motion is kind of working that bottom up and top down you can possibly elaborate a little bit yeah uh, so you know actually one of uh, i'd say you know friends of postman adam gross uh, who who was i think who, who led heroku uh, uh, talked about this particular model specifically for b2d and uh, uh, he, there there are like these three stages uh, that he articulated which map well to postman uh, you know the one is the use case of postman as a uh, tool then the second is collaboration and the third is compliance uh so uh so for postman then of course there were these things right like an individual developer uses it then a team of developer uses it and when uh, uh, the entire company uses it you have to be compliant you know you need to bring in sso you need to bring in slas about the product you need to have like you know people will not want to pay you know 100000 dollars on their card so you need to have a billing system that actually matches to their billing system so there there's very straightforward thing where you basically saying that okay the product was being used by 1% and as being used by 1000 people uh for us you know that was not the only access that we thought of we also thought of like how can the product deliver more utility to a higher level person inside an organization if we think of it as in a hierarchy and for, fortunately or rather intentionally apis actually fall in that category where somebody you know from a developer to a cio or a cto thinks about apis uh you know they are thinking about okay how is my infrastructure running you know do i have enough developers to uh, deliver applications uh, on time or with great quality you know is there a security risk that my api infrastructure has so uh, what we constantly try to figure out is okay you know developer is using the product what is a what is their manager thinking about you know okay a manager is using the product what is their director thinking about okay what is the vp thinking about and eventually kind of all the way and just having that uh, you know community and that feedback loop that actually helps us answer these questions way before the competition and then we are able to actually design the product you know around their wants uh, so yeah today you know postman is an an entire platform with you know lots of integration lots of tools and we are solving an organization wide problem while also being uh, a product that developers love and that's like you know that's the top down mix now we can go and tell our cto that okay you know you have 4000 people using postman at your organization but what you are missing is like these three layers of uh, productivity um, and uh, you know uh, a lot of times you know they are like yeah this this makes a ton of sense um thank you 
Uh, there are there are you know a couple of product questions. I will take one or two of those, and then I will change gear into something else. Uh, one question came up came just now is uh, with GraphQL becoming more and more famous, and the fact that GraphQL really doesn't need documentation because of the increasing smartness of the tech, is that impacting Postman in any way, or what is Postman's view here? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think. I have strong views on GraphQL. I think it's a great technology. Uh, actually, GraphQL is uh, probably the biggest trend uh, that has uh, come up in the last decade with respect to publicly available APIs. But uh, you know, the interesting thing with all it, so there, there are a few rules about APIs that we have learned. You know, first of all, an API never dies if it is in production. You know, there are APIs that were built 40 years ago and they're still in existence. In fact, if uh, you know we were able to theoretically say that you know uh, we would calculate the value of SOAP APIs, it might be actually more than uh, REST APIs in, in just sheer uh, dollar terms uh, with the business transactions that kind of go through. So that's one. The second is APIs mirror architectural uh, considerations. So REST high is more free flowing, which is what a lot of people use, and GraphQL is something that prioritizes the needs of you know front end developers over back end developers. Uh, and, uh, you know, that architectural style can be used by some people, but, uh, but the thing is no API self documenting. If somebody is thinking that the API self documenting, then they are, you know, like fooling themselves. Uh, and, and what we actually end up with is uh, like a backlog of any, I'd say that, you know, somebody who believes that API self documenting is actually a worse situation to be in actually, you know, writing uh, any form of thin documentation. You know, it's uh, uh, it's something that companies encounter over time, uh, and you know, honestly, with GraphQL technologies, people are discovering. You know, there are a lot of challenges uh, when you kind of design middleware, whether it's security, whether it's caching, uh, a lot of things. In fact, GraphQL was uh, one of the biggest feature requests for Postman, and you know, now we support it, and people want to actually have more and more of Postman features, uh, especially around documentation, quality testing. Uh, be supported uh, with with GraphQL as as well. So, you know, the API lifecycle is is the same across all APIs across all technologies. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, changing gears, you know, I wanted to talk a bit about um, culture. Um, you know, uh, it's it's often said that culture is what an organization does, an organization breeds, and an organization thrives on. Uh, what is Postman culture? Um, and, um, you know, how do you, and closely related to that, how do you hire talent? How do you retain talent? Yeah, so we, you know, we were, uh, so I, this is supposed to be my second startup, you know, so, and I kind of always wondered about this thing, <laughs> like this nebulous concept of a culture, right? Uh, what exactly does it mean? And some companies trumpet, you know, that we have great culture and I'm like, I don't know what that means. And, you know, you typically use, uh, uh, examples like Google and like okay, free food at the cafeteria, which is often cited as a bad example of culture, but you know, have to say it. Uh, to me, what it became very apparent as I worked at different places and I actually did a lot of client projects. It, to me, to me, you know, culture is something that's kind of like this mix of traits uh, that are, uh, that people inside the company have to solve uh, problems related to the company vision and mission. You know, it's it's how like in a company we will have come together, you know, to solve certain problems, and the way they solve it, the way they communicate, the way they take decisions, all goes into the mix of you know company culture. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I was very deliberate about uh, with Ankit and Abhiji was first we had to figure out how do we work, you know, like because uh, that is the kernel of the company and our interactions would actually shape. Uh, you know the next hire and 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 things after that. So you kind of wrote down, okay, this is the way we collaborate best. You know, we like honest uh, uh, communication. You know, we are very direct about issues. We are very curious about problems, and all of those things uh, help us work better as a team. And we then translated that, and you know, uh, when we got people on board, of course, we made some mistakes, but we had to when a problem came on at Postman, you know, how do we build the next generation of the product and how do we solve this marketing problem? Uh, that's when we applied like these cultural rules. And it's not that you're training people, you know, like go and memorize this, 
but it's that when somebody does uh, things in a way that does not abide by company culture you have to kind of correct it and then when people realize that that way of working actually uh, you know gets you better results they start dis- disseminating that culture to kind of other people so you know we uh, we articulated uh, you know these things which made postman successful to other people uh, there were a lot of examples of people to kind of go with and then you know the culture uh, essentially grew uh, to a point where we know exactly you now who fits postman and you know who does not fit postman uh, and i think the other dimension that uh, we looked at was especially when building a product company out of india one trait i wanted uh, you know postman to have is uh, be bold about our product decisions which did not come very naturally you know i'd say uh, automatically like you know if, if 10 people are there yelling at you to you know change something then it becomes very easy to give in and for that you actually have to build uh, you know things with a very curious intent and you have to figure out you have to say no you have to communicate you have to collaborate so all those things you know we actually built into the postman culture uh to uh you know come out with better outcomes towards our mission right uh, so uh, you know our mission is to maximize creativity with the power of connected software we do that you know by creating things with curiosity embracing con- constraints earning trust uh owning and delivering uh, and those are the values that then you know kind of expand into uh, specific traits that uh, you know we hire for we promote and actually then bake into our compensation systems and promotion systems because ultimately those determine how true you are to your own culture um and and uh, as as postman has grown and you are you have lot of people from many different uh, geographies and you know people are also bringing in their own modus operandi and and things like that how how has how has your thinking around culture evolved and you know there are of course local nuances or maybe like you know people are different in their own behaviors but at the end of the day there is a an underlying unifying culture um have you have you seen it like what your experience in terms of like you know i mean there are also questions of for example when you started thinking of going global uh mm-hmm. and as you start going global one of the core things that you have to maintain and also kind of foster and grow is culture that uh, so any 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 thoughts on those uh, as you like a one specific question is when do you started thinking global and as you kind of continue to grow across different geographies how do you maintain your culture and kind of yeah. uniformity yeah you know i am very optimistic that a company culture can be maintained uh, while also respecting cultural nuances that a society already has uh, you know we are generally a global society today where people do communicate across you know societal boundaries pretty freely uh, and in a way there is a global shared culture that you know especially with product companies people subscribe to though it might not be true in every sense but you know i have a uh, i have my own personal experience and i found that you know it it can be done uh, and the way you know we have kind of seen it work is it requires a lot of reinforcement and uh, uh, very clear and direct communication to first set the stage on how the company operates now most people when they come from other companies they actually bring in uh, you know what what you mentioned about their modus operandi actually you know people believe the way their world is because of the place they were at more than any anything for them that is the truth you know so when we bring people from a bigger company they like you know we don't have system x and system y we like yeah we don't have that because that's the stage we are in and hence to operate in this this is the uh, playbook you might follow and yeah if you make some mistakes we'll correct uh, you know things along the way so we had to be kind of watchful around this uh, and we did have to articulate you know this is uh, what the culture is even more so uh because people are in distributed environments and they don't really observe you know how things are going uh when when you are in a shared physical space so we uh, uh yeah you know i mean it's it's a lot of work it it requires uh, deliberate uh, practice uh i say if you are a smaller company then beginning with your executive or your managers and actually getting them uh really really uh tight i i mean we have seen more success with individual contributors you know they they get it right away they know what their job is but it's actually middle management that can 
you know break uh, or make uh, the culture and that's where things often kind of go wrong uh, and and that's where you know they they would enforce cultural practices that might not be in in norm with your company culture yeah yeah no makes makes a lot of sense uh, when did you as you started initially of course you you started building solving the problem for yourself you launched it and across the world people started using it and then you at some point i think in 2016 you moved in, you moved to us and and uh, how did you decide on kind of many of our companies many of, from many of the audience here are building saas product companies out of india and always this question comes in that you know i mean do i think of global from day one and if i'm thinking of global from day day one at what point do i decide that a first of all how do you decide whether i have to go or not but most of the cases i think the ceo probably would need to move then the question becomes like when i would move and some of the you know two three things to take care of during that initial move yeah i mean i'd say the way i answered it was you know kind of a very it was a very simple set of questions you know do we want postman to be a category leader global company the answer was yes so you know we then the second question is how do you maximize the probabilities of success uh to get there and and for us the answer was yeah we have to come to the bay area at a certain point in time you know like uh, yeah, as as i think we have proven uh, you know the the question that we started with when we were building the company was can a great product be built out of india uh or actually you know effectively wherever you are from you know you have to assemble the right talent people have the know how uh, especially when you are building things that are delivered on the web or mobile applications so i think that problem is is very well uh, solvable and you can solve it with a very high probability and as an entrepreneur i kind of think of all the ways in which uh, you know uh, the company can fail and uh, you know picking uh, something that has a high probability of success is is something that i would always default to so uh if an entrepreneur believes that okay you know this is my local market the way to actually be successful you know uh, for that market and that's where i would begin is uh, is you know being in india then you know maybe that's that's what's good for you uh, for us you know we started getting feedback about our pricing our uh, product very early uh, you know from the us market and uh, when before i moved i was visiting offices all across the bay area i traveled to seattle i went to you know uh, chicago uh, so uh, you know i kind of did all of those things uh, before uh, you know like we wasn't uh, you know jumping into it like you know uh, oh my god the only thing to make a company is in, in the bay area but we saw that that's where you know uh, the highest uh, success probability is going to be didn't mean that we were hiring hundreds of people in the bay area but making sure that we would we would build a great go to market motion we build a great management team you know so that's how i kind of think about it and uh, uh, yeah you know there's just much more many more resources available uh, there are many more uh, uh, you know options available for lots of different areas you know we could get we could work with great uh, uh, advisors you know we would work with uh, we would you know you would casually chat with industry leaders who are, have already seen some parts of your story play out before uh, and honestly you know it always also kept i think us as founders very humble you know like uh, uh, if if you think you have done a great job then there are people who have done a better job and you better learn from it uh, so i'd say if there's nothing else you know <laughs> just just coming and meeting with uh, you know great founders or great executors just teaches you to be like yeah you don't know everything and that's actually one of the biggest traps one can get into like yeah now we have solved a particular problem so you know billion dollar company uh, take mark and and you know it doesn't happen that way very very well said uh, staying on the global theme and talking about something which is very topical how has that just been to work from home been for you uh, any any work from home practice you want to share which you which has really worked for you and and related to that post covid do you con- do, would you expect how do you expect like you know would you be building building uh, offices or maintaining offices rather or or you would expect you know work from home to be a more kind of permanent shift yeah i mean you know i think work from home actually is not a problem fundamentally 
uh, because we have been uh, ha- we have people who are working from home you know i uh, <laughs> just just for kicks right like post postman's founders worked in inside the office till 2016 uh, we moved into our office uh, actually after i moved here and then i worked from home again in the bay area so uh, we basically were working from home effectively which became our office for a very long time uh, so that technically is not a problem i also did the whole like you know i'm like the only person who's remote and there are people working you know in bangalore uh, the problem is is when you're working only at home without any social contact and that's just a very different problem than uh, working you know from home so uh, so i would kind of just deal in it that you know when we when people were in this work from home mode we could actually get people together we fly people for a tour we pay for conferences and they could have social interaction with you know other people around uh, uh, in that uh, peer community and that keeps them motivated keeps everyone engaged in in today's world where we actually just you know uh, you know some people just don't have any social interaction or it's not safe to do so honestly it's it's extremely hard and i think what we have done is uh, basically making sure we have flexible policies uh, we gave people time off you know we made sure you know we can make them stay comfortable uh, when they are working uh, and we are still a small company so you know we we try to do as much as we could um, i think a practice that works well i'd say in the initial days was that you know people would just jump into zoom meetings all the time to solve a problem which is the absolute worst way of you know using zoom uh, so like yeah let's get together and then you're doing this time zone alignment and you're like what's the purpose of this meeting and everybody stressed because you're on zoom meetings all the time right even actually setting up a physical meeting has a delay uh, which is just because you know people will <laughs> will chat in the hallway before getting into a meeting and because that thing is just not there you are you are in zoom meetings all the time so what we made it as a rule was that before you go in a meeting you know there should be a written document that uh, you know people have either shared prior to the meeting or has been created as an artifact and the outcomes of the meeting and the purpose is well defined uh, if if not then people should just you know not have a meeting like i would actually prefer to not have meetings that people are glued uh, on on their screens uh and trying to kind of figure out why you know what are these 15 talking heads saying <laughs> you know on the laptop that's where i've seen like people actually get more stressed so our our effect has been to go even more towards you know writing stuff down and um and there are some good questions coming up um you know there are a couple of questions around again going back to monetization not so much on what to monetize but when to monetize and specifically one question was around series a or slightly prior to that would you have monthly growth targets or specific tactics to hit that or did you just focus on product and took whatever growth that came from that i can i can add, add one thing here and then because you know we we did the series a all all we all we saw was how spontaneously abina was one person three person and then all over the world how people are adopting it so that was at the end of the day what we cared for was are you building something which is offering spontaneous value are people being able to seamlessly use it and get value because the principle that we follow is that after that things will follow i mean it's not that you 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 will just monetize without thinking you would need to understand and you need to figure out you know what you would monetize but it's you cannot like you know never i mean one of the one of the advice would be you should not be kind of strategizing thinking that you will get funding if you can figure out monetization rather change the problem and say that what are you solving uh, how you are offering value and have you gone to a point when you can say clearly that this is how we will monetize but i would i would let uh, abhinav answer around the when part of monetization yeah i mean i would second that uh, you know one an interesting uh, book which i recommended to everyone in our beginning uh, journey was to read the startup owners manual by steve blank which is a very good book on uh, for this particular question um, so uh, to second to what jishnu you said right like i i have often seen or maybe that's what i kind of learned was that you cannot have your business model be driven by investor expectations you have to be uh, 
uh, driven by your customer expectations, right? And what happens is Very well in the interest of you know you raising money, uh, investor expectations become a proxy for a business model that actually brings down both the investor and the founder, because then <laughs> nobody knows who the customer is, right? Uh, <laughs> And uh, and that's what like the harsh truth I think for everybody is, and I'd say every business has to think about it. I mean, we think about it like all the time. It, it never gets done. So uh, so now the question is kind of at a more tactical level. You know, when to monetize, right? I can share some bits from my experience that building a monetization muscle is different than choosing your ultimate model for scaling up monetization. So I have been paid in all forms uh, throughout Postman's history, and I've tried out all business models. You know, Postman actually had a, a logo of a company uh, that you know uh, would probably at a smaller scale than Postman, and you know I got uh, a couple of hundred dollars a month for that. Right? Could have become maybe would have gone into an advertising model at that, that time. You know, people used to send money through you know, just for sending them a zip file of Postman and they would give me $5, $10, you know. Uh, I came from the in-app purchase model for mobile phones. So I added a $10 purchase and uh, people start buying that in bulk. And sometimes people would just send money because, you know, they, they just like using Postman. And none of those, like these things were ways to make money, but uh, we were doing two things at the same time. We were trying to observe why are people giving money. And secondly, it helped us, uh, kind of stay grounded with the fact that, you know, you have to deliver, uh, you know, value. And, and once you kind of discover that repeatable motion or any which way it's coming, right? So if it had happened that if we added, you know, two logos and then 50 people came in and said, we also want to put your logo in there, you know, uh, would have resulted in a completely different business model. So my suggestion is always to keep experimenting and keep trying and not lose that, uh, ability and just like you're iterating on the product at some point you will see something as a pattern that is very very clear and distinct like the checks that I was processing until 2017 just became so numerous that you were like why is that happening who's sending this check right and turns out it's the procurement person so what are we doing for procurement people right like yeah we don't have anything right we we uh, okay what do we need to kind of do, do that so it can happen very early on in the cycle. Uh, uh, but I think the midpoint for me is uh, if, uh, if the distribution of your customers is pretty wide and it's a repeatable motion, motion especially in product-led, then it's a good thing. But if, the, if you have a customer that has 25% of your revenue and everybody else is like super small or is 50% of your revenue, then probably you, you don't want to actually monetize with that motion a lot, like in the early monetization then hurts in that case where you can show that, okay, I have this much in revenue. Like, you know, you might hit that theoretical $1 million ARR uh, number, but it's like half a million is coming from a promise of one enterprise customer and the rest is not repeatable. So you kind of run that risk when you're going into that particular motion. So I would, uh, I, we kind of dialed it down and we actually made more of our product free and we lost that revenue to actually then build a better model around SaaS subscription revenue that came into it. Thank you, thank you. Um, Abhinav, what is, what is the most important job of a CEO in your opinion? So <laughs> I, I was thinking about this actually, uh, and I was like, okay, maybe I'm gonna throw out like a meta way to answer it. You know, the most important job of a CEO is to find out the most important problem for the company and focusing the company on that uh, at different stages. Uh, it's like, I think the CEO is the one who, uh, you know, you have two patterns of operating. One is information, aval an avalanche of information that comes to you. You know, there are people selling you products. There are people telling you about, you know, problems. There are people asking things on the product. There are salespeople, you know, like asking you about, you know, n number of different things. And uh, what happens is that you, if you have this fixed bias that, okay, I'm only going to do strategy or I'm only going to do X, uh, you might miss out on something, as I have found out, on, on a, a critical blocker that actually, you know, is, is away from the noise that you're seeing. 
So I kind of made it a point to kind of audit, you know, what is the most important thing for me to do like every quarter. And it has changed with the growth of the company. Like in 2015, our goal was to build, uh, you know, uh, our, our first version of the collaboration system. We didn't care about, you know, uh, 50 different, we didn't care about marketing. We didn't care about any, uh, things and we had to get, get the company focused on that one thing. Even in a very early stage, you can have engineers doing like, you know, multiple things and the company kind of gets distracted. Uh, 2017, you know, the goal was to establish, you know, a marketing presence. That was the most important thing for the company. And you can kind of craft it into like a strategy bit that you're thinking, but I always feel, especially for early stage founders, strategy is a very big loaded word. Uh, I think the CEO's job is is cutting out the crap and and focusing everybody on that one thing because you are responsible for that. And if three months later you look back at how the last three months were, it the only thing you want to regret it. There was a problem that was more important than the one I stuck my head in, and I wish I had solved that earlier. Very very well said. <laughs> very well said. Um, what's the toughest decision you had to take as a CEO and learning from it? Uh, I think the toughest decision are always around like company restructuring and people. Uh, it's something that is extremely hard and you, I think everybody has to go through this rite of passage uh, when they learn it for the first time. Uh, you know, we hire uh, for the long term at Postman. We try to invest in a lot of growth very early on. We try to, you know, lay out the goalposts, but there are times when people just uh, you know, do either don't want to do that uh, job that you think they will, uh, th- you know, they will do or are cut out to do, and then you have to sit, take certain decisions. And I think uh, every time I have to kind of, you know, basically figure out, okay, this is this is the point when things have run their course, and you know, we have to kind of build a ramp for people, uh, uh, you know, which respects you know, what they have done for the company while also hopefully finding them uh, a place inside the company where they stay for the long term. But changing somebody's role is always, you know, the hardest thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, what worries you the most today? It's one of the questions uh, that someone asked. Uh, what, what's the question? What worries you, what you, what you the most today? Uh, <laughs> what keeps I mean, you awake most at night? Yeah, that's, that's a question I kind of get it. In it. So I actually sleep very well. <laughs> <laughs> I try to sleep very well. I would encourage everybody to sleep, uh, you know, get your eight hours. So I don't worry about things at, at night. I worry about things in the day. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, you know, I think I uh, keep uh, my primary focus as the company has grown is just getting the absolute best talent uh, and best people in the company across every single level. And when I don't have that, I worry about it. And that uh, is something that we have to consistently kind of get better at. Eventually, uh, if you see the output uh, of, you know, hundreds of people working in concert, you know, to ship a great product or, you know, kind of create an outcome for the customer, like every one of that matters Uh, and, and, not having that uh, and not knowing that you know there is a gap worries me that we might have suboptimal outcomes in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, on on fundraising, there is an interesting question. What were the parameters that you used while selecting your investors? Um, what did you look for in them apart from capital? Um, so you know, capital. Capital is, uh, you know, one thing that you kind of realize uh, is if if your product is doing well, capital uh, is is available as a number from a lot of different, uh, you know, uh, firms. I think for us, there was like the first thing was just, you know, vision alignment. Like, do they see the world like the way we do? Uh, uh, Do they see the space like the way we do? Uh, Is there alignment uh, and there's confidence in the way that we want to build the business, you know, is, is that thing kind of well set? Uh, can they uh, add value to our uh, uh, next stage as a company? 
uh, and uh, we kind of looked at you know there's a great number of investors out there who bring like different complementary capabilities so we kind of you know looked at that um, and i think there are there were other things around uh, like network and uh, a bunch of other things that were i think we we just took it as an obvious you know thing that you know investors generally have you know overall great networks so for me i think the the alignment on what we are building for and how we are building is something that we always looked for and we did that with uh, at the extensive uh, pre fundraising meetings before we even went into a fundraising process yeah and uh, yeah i mean i i i'm not even sure whether there was any fundraising process for you uh, what you really focused on and which i have seen across over the years is really understanding the person and those pre fundraising meetings as you were saying and and let the fundraising be rather than making fundraising as the objective you were trying to you're focusing on understanding the person the firm and how it fit it would fit in into your long term vision of building the company so yeah. um um what were the maybe you already touched upon but specifically the question is what were the biggest challenges in building postman till date and what is the biggest challenge today um i think there were two uh, major challenges i mean the biggest one is always you know the community that we serve is extremely like demanding in a good way uh, like developers will tell you when things are good and they will also tell you when things are bad and actually the bad is is not uh, <laughs> troubling as such uh it's it's the middle when people are not saying anything you know <laughs> the fact that out of you know millions of open source projects and hundreds of thousands of things out there developers choose to place their trust in postman and us being able to deliver at scale continuously was was an extremely hard engineering and design challenge and continues to be you know we were shipping when we were three people we used to ship you know something like every day and as as we scaled your shipping velocity kind of you know uh, is possible it starts deteriorating you start aiming for bigger things you start aiming for uh, you know uh, things across a different variety of spectrums and we had to actually make sure that you know we uh, we are able to you know uh, meet meet those challenges and you know today again we are back to you know shipping every single day so this new version of one of our services that's going out and that speed of iteration and building that system uh was was a very very big challenge uh i think the second big challenge that i you know it, as as we have scaled up as a company and we continue to serve uh, different kinds of customers and different level of customers um, building a unified go to market motion that spans you know essentially multiple geographies not just within ourselves but across the world at a very early stage uh is is something that you know we kind of uh think about a lot uh while the advantage of a global uh, globally available product is that you know yeah the product is out there but you also find out that you know you have to serve the needs of people like across different time zones you have to train people in pattern recognition you have to you know uh, see a lot of different things at at the very uh, same time so uh, so building that motion is is always something that you know is a challenge Mm-hmm. Thank you. Let me ask you a few rapid fire questions. Um, sure. <laughs> <of enough. laughs> um what is your favorite enterprise SaaS tool other than Postman and why in one line? Uh Looker. You know great uh, great design, you know gives me a lot of answers. Uh <laughs> that that I'm I'm always on Looker every 2 minutes. Okay. um i know you are an you are an avid reader uh, a book you would recommend to any entrepreneur as a must read um i think high output management uh, comes up you know pretty much at the top i think high output management and the startup owners manual uh, for entrepreneurs are i'd say must reads one high output management once you have five people in the company startup owners manual when you're you know on your own <laughs> okay um what industry sites or blogs if any do you read regularly or do you think at all i mean you know one should 
pay much heed to those. <laughs> there is probably, I, there are probably I too many. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I okay. don't read that too often. I actually default to books uh, as many as I can get. So I end up buying a lot of books, which I read in bits and pieces uh, whenever something is interesting rather than uh, spending time on you know, blogs. Maybe stratchery.com, I think, you know, is this good at times, but very occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, related, kind of related thing. Do you have any favorite TV series? Do you watch TV? <laughs> I, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, my wife and I, you know, we, we love watching interesting shows. You know, we, we finished Umbrella Academy recently. I, I saw the, a, a good place, which is good. I'm trying to figure out my all time favorite. Like it's not coming to mind, but that's what we saw. Yeah, we we you know we, we knock off series, uh, TV series is quite. <laughs> um, which app on your phone you use the most? Uh, Slack. Okay. Um, your favorite food? <laughs> uh, ramen. Like, that's my guilty food. That's the one thing I loved when I came to the US, like you could get ramen. And uh, <laughs> I went to actually Japan. Uh, and interestingly, today I was around a, a reporter from Japan. So that's fresh in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. Um, a leader you admire the most? Uh, Jeff Bezos uh, in the tech uh, sector right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, in an alternate universe, you are not the founder of Postman. What profession would you opt for? You know, I've been a developer since I was in like school. So I am very bad at other things, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> so I would have been, uh, I would just have been coding. I don't, I can't think of anything else. <laughs> yeah, um, nice, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, let me see, you know, if there are some questions, we are kind of uh, coming towards the close of our 90 minute session. Um, yeah, there are some, actually quite a few questions. Let me see, you know, what I can. Um, uh, how did you identify influencers, evangelists within the community in early days? How did you align their incentives? Was it organic or you had to build it out? Um, I, I, like, you know, it may not may not be, uh, something that you focused on, but I thought it's an it's a pertinent question that that goes on in people's mind. Yeah, uh, so I you know kind of uh, would read through stuff that is out there about the product about APIs like a you know vacuum <laughs> cleaner. Like I would just suck out everything that's out there. And that is like, you know, then who's talking about the product. I talked to everyone in the community very, very early on. And, uh, you know, sometimes people would reach out and sometimes I would reach out. So, uh, as I said, right, like communities are formed around like key ideas and you can easily find out who is driving those ideas. Uh, and I would read everything that's available. I would read mentions of the product. I would answer support queries. I would look at, uh, you know, which actually, honestly, like was way beyond my nature in 2012, which was just like, you know, coder working in your editor. And uh, that helped me actually identify who was most passionate about the space in a genuine way and uh, who really cared. Um, yeah, so if you have to identify the community, you have to engage with them at, at a level where they see you as peers. And that's when you, mm -hmm. you know, kind of know them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, another question, I thought it's, it's quite, it comes up, I mean, you know, it probably is quite common uh, in entrepreneurs' mind. How did, how did the co-founders resolve issues internally as you were scaling? Did you decide that the CEO would take the final call, et cetera, or you had any other framework? I think uh, it was very well uh, established that the CEO has to take the final call. And I would actually encourage everyone to have it that way uh, i think where we uh, were able to define things better was you know you have a, a decision making system early on and you have clear boundaries of responsibilities because as a ceo you don't want to take every decision you want to take a few key decisions 
uh, and you have delegated probably most of it to other people so uh, you know when i think we we are pretty particular about role definitions and uh, uh, you know my co-founders uh, would take hundreds of decisions on their own and there are certain things that you know we have set as you know this is why we founded the company this is who we wanted to work with and that's the culture of the company and that's where it's a shared decision but uh, yeah if there's not enough data if there is not enough con- consensus then as a ceo you do have to take a call mhm mhm um and um, you know um, for for many of the entrepreneurs who are building global companies out of india um what would be your advice in such times more so keeping in light of all the changes that's happening you know whether it is the geopolitical situation or covid um when how should they be thinking about you know setting up offices in us or you know or would you suggest that even can it can be like totally distributed even in us like you know they can have a work from home policy and maybe just like you know kind of a satellite a kind of some place where they can meet meet uh, customers or or stakeholders if needed uh, how how do you how what would be your suggestion to them yeah i mean you know the silver lining in all of this is that all of us uh, across the world are just used to remote now so things that you were doing as an option are something that would be taken for granted pretty easily you know sending people a zoom invite is going to be the norm and it will continue to be so uh, postman had flexible policies and work from home before any of those things were set we had them even when we had an office and our philosophy was that you know for smart intellectual people there is no way you can you know force have anybody's brain to work so <laughs> uh, you know please do not come with just your bodies you know that's what we used to say you know bring your brain and if the brain is not working then you know better to stay at home and then recharge so i would encourage that you can you know take that over i think that's what uh, most people you know uh, uh, that's how most people operate especially in this world Uh, i think yeah there are lots of uh, things for us to you know be optimistic about uh, i'm you know as an entrepreneur i believe being optimistic rather than pessimistic is better for you as an entrepreneur because the world at a macro scale does get better over time even though there might be smaller blips where things don't look good you know my uh, it didn't it wasn't easy for me to get a visa uh, i think my advice would be to always get the best lawyer and the best accountant that money can pay for and <laughs> and leave it to them and hold them accountable if you want to set up a global company you care about your product if you if you are worried about your lawyer you have the wrong lawyer <laughs> yeah yeah um it's a lot of sense um lot of lot of good thoughts uh, abhinav um um maybe last question and i will also look at you know if there are any any other questions that has come up what would be your tips for budding entrepreneurs building product first software companies regardless of out of india or anywhere product first software companies what would be your tips uh i think my first bit is like identify the one problem that your product solves better than anything else like just that one thing and you will find out that once you identify it you will actually have to do it for your entire life as a company better than anybody else uh, and if the moment you kind of lose focus uh, you will find out that you know somebody else will you know do that so for product first companies it is very important for that identification to happen early on and that is baked in into the company dna uh, more tactically i would make sure that your product has uh, simplicity and a level of finesse that is often lacking uh, in today's uh, you know early stage products it's not like you know you could put a landing page and expect people to hit consumers are smarter consumers have more information than you and uh, uh, you know they are uh, generally tricking people into hitting a button is not validating anything so you have to basically make sure that the product actually serves that purpose that's why it's simpler to actually have one purpose and do it rather than doing 20 different things uh you know investing in engineering actually one thing i just don't find out is that while engineers are paid highly they are not actually valued in decision making uh you know your engineers can tell you about the right architectures and you know if they are passionate about building the company with you 
you know, sharing this is your business model and how that intersects with your engineering roadmap could be very valuable in the early days, you know, especially as your product first, because your product will keep changing over time and people find out that there's a wide drift between what they believe could be done versus, you know, what actually can be done. And, you know, that's where you have like attrition, uh, which, which hurts your company a lot. Like we have had employees, you know, with us for four or five years and they are their bedrock of the company. So yeah, those are my things. And, you know, don't be afraid. I think take bold decisions. We, we just see people not coming to, uh, you know, take uh, decisions on cutting out crap in the product or, you know, uh, uh, creating a bold point of view. I think uh, if you have done enough work with the community and you have uh, a sense of what a good product is, then communicate that with boldness and you'll find out that, you know, people will actually respect that and will not tell you 50 things to build. They will actually appreciate you for the one thing that you have built. And uh, likewise, I think, you know, on, I mean, I, I see that, you know, one question, which is interesting, what would be your tips for investors who can help startups better? Like any tips that, that enable them, enable them to help startups better? I guess, I guess you know, there are also, also, <laughs> uh, you know, investors who want to hear your, your thoughts and and you know your guidance yeah that's a that's a tough one right like i haven't done any investing <laughs> or, uh, i don't think about that uh, enough uh, i i think i have uh, i think investors are very good at pattern matching but they kind of uh, you know can forget that the whole purpose of a startup is to break a particular pattern you know so uh, you know i think I think that balance, I feel good investors really have that knack to sense, uh, you know, when the pattern is being followed and when the pattern is breaking. And I feel giving entrepreneurs that chance or that freedom and that confidence, you know, uh, helps them fortunately, you know, and even if you don't decide to invest, uh, you know, uh, like I, I, I've talked to people who, who were like, yeah, I don't know how this is going to ever make money and stuff. And, uh, now, now everybody's like uh, uh, amazing, you know, product and this and that. And it doesn't kind of like, you don't really care about uh, an opinion. As I said, right, we care more about customers, but I think, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are in a tough fight and they care about their companies every single day. And for them, that's their only shot, right? So I think uh, uh, empathy and, uh, you know, uh, like too much of pattern recognition ultimately, I think hurts investors. Very, very well said that a startup is meant to break the pattern and investors should should recognize that. Very, very well said. Uh, with that, Avinav, uh, I think we have come to, you know, it's, it's past 90 minutes. And uh, um, I would like to thank everyone who has joined us. Uh, you know, sometimes I feel that, yeah, and, and thank you for writing all these questions. I mean, you know, it just, uh, maybe maybe in future discussions, we'll, we'll, we'll make it, make it more interactive where we can also add more voices. Uh, uh, but, you know, this is our first one. So the feedback will be very appreciated. And um, yeah, you know, hopefully, hopefully everyone got some, got some nuggets here. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you again. Thank you very much. And hope you would join our future, future uh, sessions in conversation with Nexus series. Thank you, Abhinav, once again, it's quite late here and you know you have <laughs> every minute every minute you have served something or the other in your head so thank you for taking this 90 minutes with us yeah thank you for having me hopefully this was useful to people over there thanks